Um, so first of all, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for taking the time to uh, join today's virtual presentation, um, the Skeena Century Project. Uh, we are hosting today's webinar from uh, the territories of the Kitsilis, uh, Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. My name is Julia Sorosian, and I'm the Operations Director for Skeena Wild, and I will be facilitating today's information session. Uh, we hope that you're all doing okay uh, during these challenging times and you're all well. Um, we are extremely excited about today's presentation where Skeena Wild Science Director Michael Price will share the findings and the data related to his PhD research at Simon Fraser University. Um, the, these data and his research share a complex story um, of Skeena salmon over the past century. Um, and, and also please know that this is new research. It's, it's hot off the shelf um, and a complex story is, is emerging. Um, and so while some of the results have been pu published, um, some have not and the analyses are, are ongoing. And so we ask that you not share the graphs um, of the presentation today. Um, and then also after today's presentation, we will be opening it up um, for the remainder of the hour for questions and comments. Uh, if you want to ask a question directly to Mike, uh, please use the raise hand function, which is a button located at the bottom of, of your toolbar on your screen. Uh, if you'd prefer to just use the Q&A function, uh, please do so. I will be prioritizing and grouping your questions as they come in and we'll do our best to get to all of them today. Um, and if, if we can't for some reason make it to your question and you'd like to follow up, please send us an email, uh, info at skeenawild.org. We'll do our best to get to your, to your answers. Um, and uh, also know that we're recording today's presentation. So if you miss something or you wanna look back on this presentation, you'll be able to, to do so by accessing our archived webinars on our website and also um, through our YouTube channel. So before I pass it uh, over to Greg, uh, or sorry, over to Mike, I just wanna thank you all again for taking time out of your day to join today's presentation. So without further ado, I'll pass it over to you, Mike. Okay, thank you, Julia. And yes, thanks for everyone uh, tuning in over their lunch hours. Um, so yes, I should give credit right off the bat, um, not only to Skeena Wild, uh, Julia and Greg, um, but also to my academic collaborators. So I've listed um, many of the sort of most relevant here. Uh, at Simon Fraser University and beyond, and there's many other colleagues uh, that I'm continuing to to work on. And um, yes, this everything I'm going to show you is from the last three and a half years of um, my PhD work. And some of it is more polished than others. It sort of goes from more polished to less polished, but hopefully it it forms an interesting story. Um, and really, I should begin with my own interest. You know, I have the uh, real uh, interest in the deep past. I feel like one thing that's missing from our present day, often from research, um, you know, scientific research is sort of this historical context of where we've come from. And most oftentimes we're talking about sort of the last decade or the last couple of decades and trying to assess change over that time period. And I feel it's really important to dive a bit deeper, you know, for salmon in particular, salmon in the Skeena, they've undergone significant changes over the last 150 years. And prior to me taking on this project, we really weren't hearing much of what has occurred prior to um, 1960. Uh, so I'm hoping to fill that sort of data gap or information gap, but also just broadly, I'm interested in history, whether that's the social history or the ecological history, really they are entwined. Um, and so I'll begin just with this photograph. This is Hagelgut Canyon. So on the Bulkley River, just uh, upstream of where uh, it enters the Skeena River. And you can see the village of Hagelgut uh, up on the bench here. This is in 1910. So this really forms the beginning of my own time period and for the historical data that I'll show. 
Um, and you may also see, it depends on your screen, but you may see that, you know, change has already occurred. Um, most, if not all of the indigenous uh, youth in this photograph are dressed in sort of modern uh, attire. They do, there's a couple of fishing poles you can see on the far uh, left. So change has occurred, but it also, it is deep enough in our past uh, to be really where the onset of commercial fishing or habitat degradation occurred for the schema. So I feel it's a real important time period to think of as a baseline. Um, but before we get there, I, when I entered the PhD, I, um, I really wanted to know well, where are populations at today, just over this recent period. So that's really where we'll start is sort of the, since 1960, you know, where have we, how far have we come? And in particular, um, the wild salmon policy for, the, for folks not familiar um, was seen as a real transformative uh, change in salmon management and conservation. This came out in 2005. So I was really interested to see since 2005, have things improved for salmon monitoring and salmon conservation? So this first chapter of my thesis explored that. Uh, in the, um, uh, this top graph just shows the number of streams that are monitored in a given year. So when I say monitored, uh, they've gone in and counted fish in that year. So we have a data point for a given species. It could be one species, it could be uh, all salmon species. Uh, and this is for the uh, central and north coast. And the top black line is the total number of streams that have a spawning count. They estimated the spawning numbers. And the bottom line are indicator streams. And indicator streams are streams that um, typically they're the larger streams, the more productive streams. And these are streams that are monitored generally year after year after year. And this dashed line represents the point at which the wild salmon policy uh, came into being. And so one, again, question was, well, has monitoring, has the fundamental data in salmon management improved? Well, how has it changed over time? But two, has it improved since 2005? And we can say, no, in fact, it has continued to decline. And the last year that I have, and that we had on these data was 2014, and it was the lowest ever. And consider that there's more than 2,500 known salmon streams, salmon spawning streams on the north and central coast. So uh, at one point in the mid 80s, you know, we had more than half of streams that uh, individuals would have visited, collected these data, and now we're down to about 18%. So we're the, really the lowest level era ever. And this is just the percentage of streams. Again, it's the gray line. So these are the indicator streams. These are where management How has that since wild salmon policy came into being? We've seen a 34% decline. Again, it's at its lowest level ever. So ever, um, and so we're losing the fundamental data by which we need to assess the health of populations on the central and north coast, but really throughout British Columbia. So then I set out to um, look at the health of these populations. We now call populations conservation units. Uh, this came about through the wild salmon policy. And for each species, this isn't pertaining just to the Skeena. This is the central and north coast. The Skeena are included. And uh, looking at two time periods. After is literally the 10-year period since the wild salmon policy. So that was 2005 to 2014. And before is the decade before the wild salmon policy. And how has the status, how has the health of these populations changed? And we could see... Chinook in particular, we see, um, or, and I should just mention it's intuitive, but green means healthy populations. These are in percent. Um, yellow or amber is of concern and red is threatened with extinction. The gray is unknown. We just don't have the data to assess status. So we can see Chinook across the central north coast uh, for these conservation units has increased in the number of populations with red status. We see a similar trend with chum, although we're now only seeing uh, 
5% of CHUM uh, with healthy populations. We have seen some improvements, again, across this very broad region. We've seen a slight increase in uh, the number of coho populations that are healthy. Much of that had to do with uh, the significant restrictions that came in in the late 90s, uh, fishing restrictions uh, and exploitation on them. Uh, pink salmon can be divided into even years and odd years. They have, uh, they literally come back every two years and you can think of them as somewhat subspecies. So for the even years, when those pinks come back on the even year run, we've seen a decline uh, in those populations, but an opposite uh, trend for the odd year line, we actually see uh, somewhat of an improvement over um, the decade uh, since the wild salmon policy. And finally, sockeye salmon, we've seen a slight decrease in their health. And across uh, all conservation units, um, again, for the central and north coast, we see that chum, as I mentioned, we see only about 5% of these conservation units or populations with healthy status. Chinook are at about 12% uh, healthy status. Uh, sockeye are at 15%, so those are kind of the low ones. But I think one of the big take homes, and this was uh, seen in that monitoring figure that I showed, is that 50% of all populations, all of these conservation units, have insufficient data over the last decade to determine their status. So we only know the health of 50% of the populations on BC Central North Coast. And I suspect, um, I deeply suspect that these unknown populations, many of these, and we should consider many of these as being in the red or amber zone, it's unlikely that many of these data deficient um, populations will actually be healthy. But it just shows, um, yeah, how populations are doing in this broad region, but also how little data we have over the most recent period, which is 1960. And if we think of exploitation, it's certainly one major stressor, one major negative influence on populations. Um, exploitation generally has declined over this last decade since the wild salmon policy. And uh, we, when I did the analysis, I could see that three conservation units, um, if, if exploitation hadn't been reduced, three conservation units would have declined in status to red. So the decline in exploitation that's been shown for fisheries has helped a few populations. It's helped three in particular. But, uh, and this figure shows this in particular, of the 24 conservation units that currently are with red status, they're of threatened status, had exploitation been reduced, yes, in some instances up to 100%, we would have reduced the number of conservation units from 24 down to 14. So 10 conservation units would have improved in status had we restricted fisheries more than we have. And six of these are Chinook um, conservation units. So exploitation still plays a major role in um, the status, in the health of these populations on the central north coast. Um, but sort of bringing us back to, well, there's more of a story here because those data I just showed were, at least for sockeye, which are the most data rich species, um, species like Chinook, the baseline, the starting point of our recent data are 1980. And some of these, it could be 1970, depends on the population. But even given that 1960 as a fair starting point, commercial fishing and industrial um, development in the Skeena really has been at play for more than 140 years. So there's um, much more of this story yet to unfold in terms of the health of our salmon populations on the coast. And my story in particular really starts uh, in 1870 uh, at a place called Port Essington. So this is an image of Port Essington, I think in 1905-ish range. Um, it started in 1870 with uh, a fella, he used to work for the Hudson Bay um, Company, 
I think it was Port Simpson up north, and he decided to break out on his own, start his own trading post at the mouth of the Skeena. Uh, it was known as Spokeshoot at the time um, by the Shimshin um, peoples as sort of the last camping site on the Skeena. So it's right at the mouth of the Skeena. I'll show you a quick figure um, of its location in a second. Um, but he started this trading post in uh, 1870 and it became the principal town and the entry point for settlers to come into the um, into the Skeena. And it really became a thriving town right from its outset. Um, fewer people lived uh, here in the winter as opposed to the summer, um, but still it had all the amenities you could imagine, obviously church, um, schools, uh, tobacco shops, saloons, etc. So steamships would come up from Vancouver um, and arrive at Port Essington here. Um, Prince Rupert is located here, it's the upper red dot. And then from Port Essington, you could either hire uh, indigenous guides that would take you the 200 miles further up uh, the Skeena to the Hudson Bay Trading Post of Hazleton. Um, and then you can obviously go beyond uh, inland from there. But then I think 20 years after uh, this period of 1870, I think it was about 1890, the first stern wheelers arrived on the Skeena, so many more people could travel inland. This really, again, was the entry point uh, for industrial development um, into the Skeena. And at Hazleton, this is actually the Hudson Bay um, trading post in Hazleton. Uh, people could hire mule trains, get their supplies from uh, Hudson Bay Company, load up, and then move further inland to Babine Lake, where there was another Hudson Bay um, trading post at Fort Babine, and go beyond into the Omanika gold fields uh, for those seeking their riches. Um, but for most at Port Essington, it was salmon canneries that um, and the salmon fishing industry that began in 1877, so seven years after Port Essington was established, uh, they became the principal employer um, for the region. And uh, the fishing industry in general what generally targeted sockeye and chinook in this early period. Um, pink and chum were not, um, they weren't marketable species. But in the sockeye fishery in particular, during those first three weeks as sockeye were um, making their way into the um, Skeena estuary in the mouth of the Skeena, these uh, rowboats, 20 foot rowboats with nine foot, 10 foot oars with two men per boat, they would tie onto a cannery tug and they'd be towed out to the mouth of the Skeena wherever their favored um, fishing spot was. And when they, came to or got near their favorite fishing spot, they'd release their line and then be, they'd be set free for, oftentimes it'd be for the week of fishing um, and they'd uh, return. The camps, these are just salmon camps so they could drop their uh, daily fish off at the camps. Uh, and then go off and, and fish again for the next day, etc. They'd sleep on their boats. Some would sleep on an island or land, but they had these little canvas tents on the bow of their boats where they could just tuck under uh, for a bit of shelter. But it was just oar and sail um, up until 1924 on the Skeena. No motorized vessels were allowed until 1924. And while this is an image of um, the Fraser River, uh, and similar fisheries, although they allowed motorboats earlier on, I think maybe 1915, 1916 maybe. Um, on the Skeena, the most number of boats fishing at one time was 1,300 in a given year, uh, and that compared to the Fraser at more than 3,500 in a given year. But still, 1,300 vessels uh, fishing for salmon six days a week, um, certainly was able to um, catch a number of fish. So Sundays were really the only day of rest for the fishermen and the fish. It was a time to mend nets and resupply, uh, get their food for the week and, and what have you. 
Um, and it was actually in 1912 when concerns were starting to be raised of declining catches in various regions, not only the Skeena, the Fraser was the first Canadian Pacific uh, region to open up to commercial fishing. Um, but in 1912, they started a research program where they began collecting scales, uh, not only in the Skeena, but again in the Fraser, they did it as well in Rivers Inlet and the Nass River, these four main sockeye producing regions, starting up a research program to collect scales from fish caught uh, in the commercial fishery. Um, these fish were um, brought to canneries and a fishery officer, this one in particular, um, Robert Gibson, he was based in Port Essington, so they had a fisheries office in Port Essington and he'd go down every day to the canneries. Um, and while in 1912 it was quite a haphazard collection, they just over a few days, over the two month long fishery, they collected a bunch of scales, a couple hundred scales. Beginning about 1918, they were collecting 125, um, sampling 125 fish every three days of the fishery for two months long. So the sockeye fishery tended to take place from the last week in June till mid-August, however long sockeye lasted. And for each fish that they sampled, they would collect a glob of scales. They would write down the weight and the length and the sex of the fish, as well as the date of capture. And sometimes, and I wish they had done it more often, they would write down detailed notes of the fishery you know, how many fish were caught by what they called the high boat, the boat that caught the most number of fish. And also at times they give sort of weather conditions, you know, they're not catching many fish because it's been raining a lot, etc. They did not do this very often. Um, in this one year, 1919, they did it for every three days of the fishery. So there's just invaluable information um, in this collection. And it took place from 1912 right till 1947. So we have this really rich um, uh, collection of scales and biological data that has formed my um, PhD. And some people ask me, well, what can you really tell from scales? And the more I looked into it, well, it's actually, we can tell quite a lot. We can look at a scale and like the concentric rings in the core of a tree, we can measure the growth in fresh water and each winter, like a tree, that growth slows for fish and so you start to get this dark band uh, that represents the winter annuli. Uh, and we can measure the growth for each of these years in uh, their freshwater environment, but also in the marine environment. You can see that growth increases once they get to the marine environment, there's more food. That's really the reason that drove salmon into the ocean to grow large. Uh, and you can count each of these, um, years up to get the overall age or really the life history story of a given fish and modern genetic tools allow us to identify a scale to population. And um, we have known at least for some time how many sockeye uh, had been produced in the Skeena right back to 1877 the start of the commercial fishery and these are those data here. So they show that um, Skeena salmon have gone through their cycles of high abundance, certainly during this early period up till about 1920 and then a deep dive until about 1950 and a resurgence in the late 60s, 70s for sure and beyond. And now we seem to be hitting uh, another low productive period. Although the story is complicated in that um, for those unfamiliar, um, we have created several spawning channels, so increasing spawning habitat, uh, as well as being able to improve the um, freshwater environment for those eggs uh, in Babine Lake or on tributaries of Babine Lake. Uh, and they began in 1970 to start producing fish and these gray bars represent the actual number of fish being produced from spawning channels. So instead of that undulation over time, we're actually seeing wild fish generally have taken a decline from the 20s down to their lowest level ever. And this um, 
this figure really got me thinking, well, I wonder if individual populations, because this is across all populations of sockeye in the schema, have individual populations um, declined at the same rates? And if they haven't, why are we seeing differences in changes in population size? So the first step for me in entering the PhD was to identify these scales to population. So we've now sent off some 5,500 scales to DFO's molecular genetics lab to be identified to population. And while we do have a coarse res resolution for these data, we're able to identify 13. Uh, think of them as metapopulations. They represent the major tributaries of sockeye in the Skeena. So this is the Bulkley River, uh, and we know that there's individual spawning populations, even within Maurice Lake, Atna Lake at its tip, but there's also the upper Bulkley. Same with the Kispiox number seven, there's multiple nursery lakes. These do represent individual, multiple conservation units, but our genetic resolution at the moment only allows us to see this Kispiox as one population. But even still, we're, we're able to see in these old scales, 13 of the major populations in the Skeena. And in terms of their abundances over time, um, once I knew the proportions of these individual populations, I'm not gonna bore you with the details, um, but I reconstructed historical abundance, which depended on sort of the runtime, the various proportions of these populations, et cetera. Um, I've reconstructed it for these three time periods and they represent the years in which I have scales. So in the historical years, I have 1913 to 23, that's in blue. And for the Bulkley sockeye, we saw about 70,000 fish on average. So the dots represent the mean abundance in a given time period. And these are just distributions. Don't pay too much attention to that. Just look at where the, where the peak in these distributions is and that tells you the average number in a given time period. So about 70,000 sockeye returned to the Bulkley in this early time period. That increased over the 33 to 47 time period at over 100, 115,000 fish each year in that time period. And that compares to the most recent time period, 2010 to 2017 at under 20,000 fish. So the Bulkley in particular has seen uh, certainly have seen some changes over the historical time period, but a dramatic decline uh, in the recent period. And across all populations, we see similar trends. Uh, the only difference here compared to that last one are the distributions in red, and these represent those populations, three of them, <clears throat> excuse me, that have enhanced fish. So we we're producing fish in spawning channels or hatcheries. Um, which has in some circumstances like the babine, they're now producing more fish in the babine than they have uh, over the time period of the last century that we can tell. Um, others like Lake Els, they seem to be fish and historical abundances. Um, uh, and same with the calum. It has its consequences, which I'll uh, go into momentarily. But um, one other interesting thing about this, like I mentioned, um, the Bulkley that, you know, this second time period, 1933 to 47, they were actually more abundant. We saw different populations doing different things. The bear population, it also was more abundant in the second historical time period. Same with the extol. But other populations like Alastair, uh, the Kispiox, the Motassi, Lake Els, Zymowitz, etc. They were at their peak in that early period of 1913 to 23 and have never come back to uh, those historical levels. And it, were the, it was these differences um, in rates of decline that I was interested to test some hypotheses. What may, be, what may have driven these changes um, in population abundances over these time periods. And I had four primary hypotheses. Uh, 
The first was fishery selectivity. So up until 1950, fisheries, it was a gillnet fishery only for sockeye. And they used cotton gillnets, uh, which of one particular mesh size, five and a half inches. And it was, these cotton nets are highly, um, well, they don't stretch very much, not like the nylon nets of today. So they're very selective for a given body size. It tended to be the largest body size fish. So the hypothesis was that the largest body, or the, the populations, so each of these numbers are there, the individual sockeye populations, the populations with the largest body size should show the largest declines. That was the hypothesis. The other, another hypothesis was productivity, and we can look at the intrinsic productivity and the overall age of a given population being, you know, those older aged populations, they take longer to produce that next generation. So those populations with the oldest ages should show the largest declines. Migration distance was another. Those populations that had the furthest migrations, migration can be challenging on fish. They use a lot of their uh, reserves, but there also were in-river indigenous fisheries occurring. Uh, and so those populations that had a further migration were likely subject to um, more fishing, but also um, greater challenges. So those populations with longer distances should show um, greater declines. And finally, the hypothesis was those populations with more habitat that's been degraded should show the greatest declines. I mean, this, of all the hypotheses, this is one that just uh, showed an opposite trend. So there's no clear correlation uh, with habitat loss. But these three uh, do show the declining trend. Again, those populations of largest body size, of older ages, of furthest migrations do show uh, on average the largest declines. But we ran this into uh, a model and really just modeled uh, and tested these hypotheses um, quantitatively. And I'm not gonna get into it, but at the end of the day, our model um, that represented the hypothesis of fishery selectivity of body size was uh, the most probable driver of differences in rates of decline among populations. So fisheries selectivity um, certainly played a large role in the declines uh, in these populations over the last century. Um, I then switched gears um, and looked, started to look at diversity. This is a chapter that I've just finished up. We've uh, now officially submitted it. Uh, for publication, so hopefully everyone has their fingers crossed for us. Um, but I was interested, similar to abundance, I was interested to know has diversity changed for um, populations of sockeye in Mesquina over this last century? And there are several different metrics of diversity um, that we can quantify. One of these is their life history. So uh, this uh, figure just shows the 10 different life histories of sockeye that were expressed in the old scales uh, that I've analyzed. And so the most simple life history is for a fish, and these, this represents a very small proportion of fish of sockeye in the skeena, but they could go straight out to sea, don't spend any time in fresh water. F is fresh water, O is the ocean. These are sea type fish that go straight out to the ocean. They spend two years in the ocean and then they spawn. That's one particular life history. Another is if they spend an extra year in the ocean and return to spawn. Or uh, this is one of the more dominant life histories is for a fish to spend one year in fresh water and either two years in the ocean and spawn or three years to spawn, but they can also spend four years in spawn, etc. So, uh, and of these life histories, there are these four primary types. So 99% of sockeye that return to the skeena have these four individual life histories. And the numbers just represent um, their freshwater or ocean stage. So this one means it spent one year in a freshwater lake and two years in the ocean. 
and this is one year in fresh water and three years in the ocean. So we can look at how um, the proportions of each of these life histories has changed over the last century. So taking those four primary life histories and how they've changed, they certainly are highly variable over time. But the general trend is, or the most striking trend is, these fish that spent two years in fresh water uh, have declined considerably. So on average, they're about representing about 20% of all the life histories in the early period. They now represent roughly 5%. Uh, in this period. So more fish, the majority of fish, 90, 95% of all sockeye are rearing in a lake for one year and then going out to sea. And there could be several reasons for this change. One is, and they've shown this, researchers have shown this for Alaskan uh, rearing lakes of sockeye, in that with climate change, these rearing lakes are having uh, longer growing seasons, less uh, ice um, periods over the winter, so that ice is melting earlier and forming later each year. So it's these rearing lakes may be increasing in productivity. These fish are able to leave after one year instead of having to spend two years in a lake to get big enough to go out to sea. But another reason may be because of the enhancement, so those spawning channels, particularly in Babine Lake. Um, Babine Lake is a very productive lake and 99% of fish that rear in Babine Lake leave after one year. And so what these data show are just the percentages of the fish in a given year, the average proportion uh, across all fish in a given year uh, that leave for the ocean after one year. And the blue are wild, fish, all wild fish combined. Red is wild and the enhanced fish combined. So even though we see with wild fish, there has been a slight increase in the proportion of fish that are leaving after one year, all going to sea at the same time. Definitely with enhancement, we're seeing a much higher proportion uh, of those fish leaving after one year. And the big consequence of this is, um, right, like diversity is important to stabilize and help buffer populations from environmental variability. It's really an adaptation to environmental variability. But if 95% of your juveniles are leaving after one year, and each year thereafter they leave at the same time and they meet poor ocean conditions, uh, then they may all be. Um, affected by that, right? We're, we're having all of our eggs into this one life history basket. And something similar too with these life history, we can look at uh, how many years they spend in the ocean. So this, these in blue are just for those fish, the proportion or percent of fish that spent two years at sea before returning and those that spent three years at sea before returning. We've seen an increase in this time period in those fish spending longer in the marine environment. One of the reasons could be, well, these fish are going to sea at an earlier age. They may be smaller. They may be having to grow uh, more, you know, spend that extra year to grow. Um, but it may be also due to food or in general for them. They have spent an extra year at sea. But also uh, many studies have shown recently that there's greater competition in the ocean now than there has been over the last century, since 1925, because of an increase in hatcheries, Alaskan uh, pink salmon hatcheries, chum salmon hatcheries in Japan and Russia uh, are increasing competition with sockeye salmon at sea. And the longer these fish spend rearing in the marine environment, the lower their overall survival is. Uh, we can also look at population diversity. So in the Skeena, we have these 13 populations and they, uh, they each show uh, annual variability, some increase in abundance, some decrease in abundance. And analogous to assets in a financial portfolio, these individual populations can uh, 
buffer the overall variability of a watershed complex like the Skeena um, in terms of their overall abundance. So they can combine these different populations can stabilize the overall return of the number of fish coming back uh, to the Skeena. So this is known as the portfolio effect. Um, but we can look at population diversity in different ways. We can look at it as richness, so the actual number of different populations between two time periods and how it's changed. However, in the Skeena, we have the same 13 populations historically as we do recently, so richness really doesn't um, apply in this circumstance. But we can look at another metric of diversity known as evenness. And evenness just quantifies how even uh, each of these populations are in terms of their contributions of abundance to the overall number of sockeye returning to the Skeena. And uh, the, um, uh, the time period, think of this, uh, these as two time periods. The time period in blue is more diverse, it's more even than this time period in yellow. So we can, again, we can use this metric to quantify whether diversity has changed over these time periods. So here for evenness, each of these dots are just the mean evenness across all populations in abundance for this early time period. And evenness averaged about 0.6 in this early time period. It has declined to 0.4 uh, in the recent time period. Again, these blue dots, they represent wild fish. But when we look at wild and enhanced fish combined, the overall evenness declines to 0.2. And that's because the babine is really driving the number of fish returning to the Skeena now. It's less dependent on these individual um, wild populations for its overall uh, abundance. And we can see this in the proportions of each of those populations over time. So I've lumped the 12 non-babine populations as one versus babine in blue. And you can see historically, there were some years where these non-babine populations were more than 75% of the overall uh, proportion of abundance coming back to the Skeena. Um, whereas in the recent time period, we're now seeing on average these non babine populations contributing only about 10% to the abundance coming back to the Skeena. And in fact, 70% of all soccer returning to the Skeena now are uh, from the enhanced babine population. So in terms of portfolio effect and how this sort of homogenization of populations can affect the overall portfolio effect, the, um, what its uh, impact is on the Skeena as a whole to buffer abundances from year to year. This just shows uh, each red dot is a given population. Number two is Babine and the relative proportions in this early time period. And the coefficient of variation is just a um, quantity. It quantifies how variable these populations, each of these populations were in this early time period. And we can uh, average, if we took the average across all populations, averaging the, the amount that they varied, we can see that their overall variation was about one on this scale of coefficient of variation. Um, but if we used uh, all of these populations and thought of them as a meta population, so not just averaging, but looking as, at the complex as a whole and how much that complex as a whole varied over time, we can see it actually uh, was only about 0.5. So the difference between these two is what's known as the portfolio effect. So in this early time period, the diversity of these populations was able to reduce the annual variability in abundance by 50%. That's quite a strong portfolio effect. So we had a strong portfolio in this early time period. In the next time period, we see a reduction in uh, that portfolio effect. Uh, still relatively strong. It reduced that annual variability in abundance by 
But now in this recent time period, uh, we can see that the portfolio effect is only about 10%. So really the Skeena sockeye complex as a whole, right? The watershed as a whole is acting or behaving as if it were a single population driven by babine. So what happens to the babine um, population if it has a low abundance year, the entire Skeena sockeye has uh, or the complex has a low abundance year. And the same when uh, the babine has a really great year, the whole Skeena has a great year. It really doesn't matter what happens with these individual populations because they're contributing so little abundance. But this does not give us much insurance at all. Again, we have all our eggs in this one basket known as babine. So we're sockeye in particular uh, are highly vulnerable, especially to environmental variability. And I guess one of the big consequences of this from a practical point of view that yes, the uh, enhancement has returned abundances to historical levels uh, for commercial fisheries and fisheries along the main stem river into Babine. This is uh, just the change in abundance between the historical period, so 1913 to 47, and the recent period over the 2000s. Uh, we can see that yes, they've returned, enhancement has returned abundances to historical levels and that's propping up this commercial fishery. It's these individual wild populations that we see the largest declines in abundance, which has um, uh, challenged indigenous um, food fisheries along these tributaries as well as local ecosystems to those salmon provisions that were there historically, they are no longer there today. We're limiting uh, the number of fish coming back to one um, system in the Skeena. So it's a loss in spatial contraction over the last century. And kind of switching gears, although trying to really look at climate change um, in more detail, uh, and getting away from, some, from sorry, the, um, the fisheries and enhancement influence on sockeye populations. This is my most recent chapter, my final chapter in the thesis. I've just um, started to explore it. Uh, so these are very preliminary data. Um, but it just shows these are average, this is the average growth of sockeye across all populations. Um, but these data have been standardized against the mean or average growth over the entire time period. So any dot above the red line is simply uh, an above average growth for that given year and anything below the line is below average growth in a given year. So it just allows us to compare uh, years and see trends um, in a more illuminated way. So. Uh, this is for the first year of freshwater growth for sockeye again across all populations and it's really stark this trend in growth at least and we can think of growth as productivity um, uh, and the buffering capacity of sockeye for two things like climate change how climate change may be influencing uh, different populations through and expressed through their growth so we see this really stark decline over this early period from the early 1900s through to the 1930s and 1990s. Stabilization of growth across all sockeye populations. However, different populations again filter these climate variables differently depending on that habitat. So this is also, again, freshwater uh, growth in the first year for all sockeye just returning to the Bulkley. And they have shown, again, they do show this stark decline during this historical period, but a real rise in growth um, during the recent period. And I was gonna show the figure, but I thought it was too cluttered. Different populations show different trends. Some populations actually show um, reduced growth in this recent time period, particularly from rearing lakes that tend to be shallow and small and maybe warming up too much. You know, they're becoming 
too productive and are starting to have problems with algal blooms or or literal fish kills in the summertime when temperatures become too warm or there's um, food limitations, etc. But for these, for some glacially dominated, cold, uh, historically considered unproductive lakes, we may actually see an improvement, at least during the freshwater phase of their life history. But moving on to the first year in salt water, so the first year of ocean growth across all populations. And again, we see this decline in productivity over this early time period and a relative return or stabilization, highly variable from year to year. Worrying are the last few years in the data set where this first year of growth we're seeing um, below average, I'm sorry, below average growth. Uh, and these data only go to 2014, so it'd be really nice to see more recent uh, growth data. Um, this is for second year uh, of ocean growth, similar kind of decline over that time period. Yes, a return to favorable, perhaps ocean conditions, ocean productivity, but a worrying trend in this recent period, a low productivity period. And here in the third year, of saltwater growth. Not so much of a trend in this historical period, but we do see a decline in that productivity uh, over the recent period. So I'll eventually, this is as far as I've gotten. Um, so again, these are very preliminary, but um, with these data, I hope to test some various hypotheses, look at different climate indices to see how they may have influenced growth over time but also looking at freshwater lakes in particular and how these different habitat characteristics like the depth of the lake, the overall area, the elevation that a lake is at, how these different populations or habitats filter these different climate signals differently. So you have to stay tuned for that. Um, and that's kind of the end of my PhD trajectory. I'm hoping this time next year to at least have that dissertation in uh, and be done and dusted. But um, in the meantime, there remain what I feel some really important questions um, that are, they just, they will require more time to answer them. Um, and one of these is um, in these old scales, uh, the question is whether if we had higher genetic resolution, I did mention that we have this kind of coarse resolution, we're not able to tease apart individual spawning populations, but also something I didn't mention is we, we don't have baseline genetic data for several sockeye populations that we know at least existed in the 1960s, but we just don't monitor them anymore. And without that baseline genetic information, we can't identify a population in the historical scales. But with renewed or newer high resolution um, technology, uh, I'm hopeful that we can look at this, these group of scales from the historical period and actually be able to ask are there any populations in these old scales that have since uh, gone extinct? And we do know in the contemporary period, at least one sockeye population has winked out, and that is Seely Lake, uh, just downstream of Hazelton. Again, it doesn't show up in these historical scales because we don't have the genetic baseline. So hoping to answer that question, I think that's a super important um, question when it comes to conservation. Um, but two, um, and that brings me to this picture. I, I should have had a better transition here, but I don't. Um, but this is a field school um, of students from UMBC, and they're taking part in an archaeological dig um, on Smokehouse Island uh, in the Babine. So it's on uh, an island on Nilkikpa Lake. There's an archaeological dig there. They're washing the samples from these one meter by one meter pits that they've dug on this island and they've uncovered thousands and thousands of salmon bones that date back more than a thousand years and there's not only sockeye in this collection there's likely we don't know yet we're still just 
uh, looking into the species distributions as a first step. Um, but there's likely other species like Chinook and Coho and pink salmon uh, that were caught as food fish at the time, smoked on this island, and then discarded in fire pits and literally remain today. So it's to go back further in time, further than one century, go back a millennium and look at changes in uh, genetic diversity over time or selection pressures uh, and how those have changed over time, especially over the last 150 years of industrial development in the scheme. So you'll have to stay tuned for that. That's, um, that's coming down the pipe in a few years. Um, but otherwise, that's all I have. Um, just with great thanks to all the collaborators, contributors, partners that I've had on this project. There are many, um, and I wish to thank them. But otherwise, I'm happy to answer any questions. If we have time, I didn't even look at the time. so. Oh, yeah, we're we're we're, we're at one o'clock, and so I know that uh, some people will have to to sign out in the chat function. I have uh, added uh, some contact information for Skeena Wild and Mike specifically. So if you have a question that you're not going to have time to ask Mike in this forum, please uh, drop us a line, and uh, we'll keep the discussion going. If you are able to stick around, fantastic. Um, and also, I've posted the registration link, so if you have people in your life that you think would be interested in hearing this presentation, Mike will be giving the identical presentation on Thursday evening at 7 p.m. So just copy and paste that link. It's also on our website, and it's also on our Facebook page, um, and we will keep the lines open. So for those of you that are sticking around, we have some questions coming in, and we'll start off here. Uh, I guess before we start, thanks, Mike. That was incredible. Um, the story is just outstanding. It's so fascinating. So um, yeah, we will get cracking on questions. Um, first one coming in, what are the implications of your findings for fisheries management? Ooh, well, I think it shows the importance of maintaining a diverse portfolio. I don't think we can continue to manage for a single population like we have since 1970. I know management has been moving in the right direction. Um, the Wild Salmon Policy has helped move that forward in terms of needing, requiring us to conserve individual populations. Um, and fisheries management has been helping in terms of moving some of these commercial fisheries further upriver and to terminal locations. So we're allowing these vulnerable wild populations to return to spawn and not get caught in mixed stock fisheries. So maintaining a diverse portfolio, I think there's still an importance. Uh, and while I mentioned exploitation, so fisheries catch has declined over the recent period, I think we can still, we still need to go further. I think there needs to be further reductions, a further movement of fisheries further upriver into terminal locations. So we're just catching those populations that we know are healthy and abundant. Um, I think those are, in terms of implications for management, those are two big ones. The third I'd say is, um, in terms of that importance of diversity, it's really habitat. Much habitat in a fairly high quality state. Um, but I would say limiting industrial development, minimizing uh, any further habitat degradation, and in fact, improving the habitat that has been degraded over the last 150 years, those would be the three places to start. Great, thanks. Uh, next question, what are your thoughts on what other salmon species populations might look like? Oh, I, I don't think, and perhaps I should have had that as a, as my starter, even though I'm focused on sockeye, I think you could apply that across the board mm -hmm. when you really start to 
look at the commercial fishery and its infancy and, and particularly for species like pink and chum in the early days, you read some of these historical records of fishermen in the early 1900s when pinks were not, they were worth a cent, one penny, and you could only catch 100. That's all the canneries would allow a given fishing boat. And some of these fishermen would have their entire net uh, loaded with pink salmon, they would have to just cut it and leave it, literally not taking those pink salmon. Uh, and that happened day after day when the pink runs were big. Uh, I can imagine right across the board from Chinook to Coho that uh, we, all populations are highly depressed and we can't, you know, again, that status assessment that I did, that's only looking from 1960 and sometimes from 1980 or looking at comparing the decade before the wild salmon policy, things are much different than what they were a century ago. So I think across the board, all salmon species have been affected. Yeah. Um, so hopefully uh, that satisfies your question um, that there that was posted. Moving on, um, we've got one. I was wondering if there is a correlation between the reduction of streams monitored and budget cutbacks to DFO. Do you see the reduced amount of data to be a serious problem? And is there any way we can work towards getting back to previous monitoring levels? And this is coming yes. from Audrey Faber, who is a Master of Science candidate at UNBC Natural Resources and Environmental Studies with the Skeena as her home river. Thanks, Audrey, for the question. Oh, wow. We, we should chat, Audrey, please um, send me an email. I'd love to chat more. My answer would be yes, yes, and yes. So yes, I think um, budget cuts for sure were a part of the decline in monitoring. Uh, you know, especially during the Harper years, there were some significant cuts year after year to DFO. So not, I, I hope it wasn't the impression of um, participants, but I wasn't trying to blame the agency, um, but yes, budget cuts for sure were a problem. Um, yes, it's a problem because uh, as I showed, we only have data, sufficient data to assess the health of one half of populations uh, in British Columbia. So half the populations, we have no idea whether they're healthy or not, and many of them are continue to be caught in mixed stock commercial fisheries. Uh, we don't even know whether they're still around. Um, and yes, I think um, more money, I mean, DFO had committed to more funding for monitoring. I can't say that monitoring has improved. We'll have to wait for the next assessment. Um, so maybe I should put that on my to-do list to see how they're doing. But yes, theoretically, if they put more money into it, we, we absolutely can. And more community, more individuals can be a part of this solution. And DFO is moving in that direction in terms of indigenous communities and um, co-management of stock. But yes, it, it does require money. It does require capacity. But we can, we can do it if we want to, for sure. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, it's hard to make management decisions if we don't know what we're managing for. <laughs> um, so I would uh, offer, if there's no other questions, um, we can wrap it up. If you have a question that you would like to ask directly to Mike, um, you can do so by using the raise hand function. I can allow you to talk. Um, and so we'll just give it a, a couple more uh, seconds here for people to post any uh, questions that they may have, but it looks like that's it for questions so far. Um, and so again, uh, just a huge thank you to everybody for taking the time today to, to hear this uh, incredible story that Mike is working on unearthing. Um, we, as I mentioned, will be giving the same presentation on Thursday. Please uh, share it with your friends and family. Um, and I wish you all a wonderful afternoon. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Julia. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Yeah.